you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. Today's sponsor at Horse Chat is Online Horse College. If you're looking for a government accredited instructor qualification, have a look at onlinehorsecollege.com. Don't go there yet, though. We're going to talk to Dr. Melanie Quick now. Dr. Melanie Quick has been a guest with us before. If you'd like to have a look, go to horsechats.com. You can um, go straight to slash Melanie Quick or just search for Melanie or search for Quick and you'll find out a bit more about her. She's a vet specialising in lameness and equine spinal manipulative therapy and she's going to talk to us today about 10 common problems with horses that catch people out. I think she's very well qualified to do that. How are you today, Mel? Very well, thank you. And you? Yeah, yeah, very well, very well. Melanie, I'm just thinking this particular subject, why did you choose this one? Have you been called out, I suppose, a few times and these particular problems are fairly common or what was the, um, you know, why this particular subject of all the ones that you could have chosen? These are the uh, issues that I commonly see mistakes okay. being yep. made repeatedly mm-hmm. over the over years and still happening. Uh, mistakes being made despite professional advice. Okay. So it's okay. problems that the general public needs to become more aware of mm-hmm. because some of them have surgical implications. Yes, yes. And I think developing that awareness, you know, that's what we're all about, is to develop the awareness for people to learn. So the more they can learn, the better off the horses are going to be. Yeah, yeah. Now, you've made a couple of notes here for me. Hydration. Tell us a bit about that. And Yeah, this this one's so common. Is it? Uh, You know, a lot of horses end up in colic surgery due to them getting quietly dehydrated. Okay. The horse is an animal that when it sweats, it sweats uh, equal parts water and salt. So the little chemical receptor in in their brain doesn't tell them that they're dehydrated. Mm -hmm. So when they've had a heavy sweating session, they won't realise they're dehydrated drink. Whereas when humans sweat, we sweat more water than salt. So the little chemical receptor in our brain becomes more salty and that drives us to drink. Okay. So horses... Horses can go around 80, 100, 120 litres dehydrated because they just take the muscle out of their gut and their muscle, uh, the water. So they take the water out of their muscle and their gut. So so you could pretty much guarantee that every racehorse and almost all sport horse, nearly all sport horses out there are running around performing in a dehydrated state. And then... What happens when that occurs is at some point, particularly when the weather turns, you get impaction colics and you end up in surgery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or you're more inclined to get travel sickness when you're travelling on long journeys because the lungs dry out and uh, then the little mucociliary escalator coming up out of the chest can't lift the dust and the bacteria out of the lungs so they get pleuronemonia. That's what travel sickness is. So um, another thing that people don't realise is When they're in the horse float, for every hour of travel they do in the float, they will lose 15 litres of invisible sweat. Wow. So if you just add those numbers up, that's pretty scary. So Mm. one of the the signs of it, aside from a horse who does end up with a surprise impaction colic, is um, they'll be a bit doughy or tired after their competition. Yep. And people, and I mean, even I myself, when I used to compete heavily, I would expect my horse to be a bit tired for about four days after he'd gone and done a one-day event or a two-day event or a three-day event and, and thought nothing of it. But the reality of it is, is if I knew about hydration mm. and a better job of maintaining his electrolyte, then he would recover far faster. So uh, dehydrated horses, they don't eat as well. That's part of the reason when horses go away they stop eating because yep. they, when they get dehydrated, they stop eating. Um, they'll get flat and dull in their behaviour and, and, and they'll have a bit of a dull coat and they won't have a top line that looks as good and they'll just be generally a bit 
lacklustre in their work, so people usually put a pair of spurs on to fix it. Um, mm. And in reality, if they just hydrated them properly, in fact, I've had clients say to me, well, they've rung up and cursed me because I might say to them, look, you need four tablespoons of salt a day for the next month to get this horse to catch up, and then they ring me in a month, so I can't ride him anymore because he's bouncing out of his skin. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's a common, common cause of impaction colics. It's heavily related with transport, and, um, and you will get behavioural issues from it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just before we get on to the bad behaviour, what do we tell people then? Give them that salt for a month? So, is that going to fix at, it? Yeah. At, as a maintenance level, mm-hmm. horses need two tablespoons of salt a day maintenance. That's, mm-hmm. that's doing nothing sitting around in the paddock, not working. So I like to have people aim to get the urine of the horse clear to only slightly pale yellow. A lot of horses, when they urinate, it's, it's sort of orange to cloudy yellow. Yep. So that there's your, your first sign of dehydration. I mean, you can do your skin tent test where you pull the skin up on the neck, hold it for a few seconds and let, then let it go and it should snap back down instantly. Mm-hmm. And most horses fail that test too. You can feel their gums and they should have wet, slippery gums. And most horses are dry and sticky. But the easiest one to keep an eye on is the colour of the urine. So that urine really should be quite quite pale, uh, quite clear Mm -hmm. to only the slightest pale yellow. And if he's urinating any form of treacle, which horses are quite good at doing, uh, then you're dehydrated. So, you know, you may need, in certain weather conditions, uh, you might need four tablespoons of salt or two tablespoons of salt, two scoops of electrolytes in one day. Mm -hmm. You might even need to get up to six. You're just going to keep going until you've got that urine running clear. Okay, now the the salt and electrolytes, so give them both salt and electrolytes, and what's the difference between the two? (laughs) As a general rule, majority of horses only need plain salt. Mm -hmm. Once they start working a lot more and visibly sweating a lot in most of their workouts, they they need need a bit more than sodium and sodium chloride, which is what plain salt is. They might need a little bit of potassium and a little bit of magnesium, um, which is what's in your decent electrolyte. Um, brands, of which there's only three I tend to recommend. I'm not sponsored by them, but here they are. Yep. It's um, the three I tend to use, um, High Gains, Regain, Carter Cause, Collider Life, and Kentucky Equine Research. I think there's what's called Endura, Endura, Endura or something like that. They're the only three I use. The rest of them I don't because the ratios aren't uh, done well enough and oftentimes they put bicarb in there, which is a load of bollocks. So. Okay. Um, that's basically what I do. All right, and you talked a bit about bad behaviour before. Is it poor training? Is it pain? Bad temperament? What are the percentages? How much is poor training? How much is pain? And how much is temperament? I would say if you've got a horse who's always been quite consistent and quite a well-mannered fellow Mm -hmm. and then suddenly poor behaviour comes, you can guarantee that's going to be pain. Okay. If you've got a horse who... You know, as far as you know in its history, has always been a sort of hot-headed scatterbrain and is difficult everywhere in its life, then, then that horse might well have a bit of a, a bit of a more sensitive temperament and, mm-hmm. and it's bad training because yep. hot-headed horses need better handlers and better trainers. So my general rule of thumb is uh, never blame temperament, always blame pain first and mm-hmm. then training technique second because, I mean, before I sort of started occasionally helping people with training, I would say once I started my veterinary chiropractic work, I would say 80 to 90% of horses' behavioural issues responded with the treatments I was giving them, whether that meant identifying saddle fit problems, identifying spinal pain, identifying, you know, lameness issues. So, before I reach towards training techniques to solve the behavioural issue, I will always um, rule out pain. And then if I'm happy I've got their body in a healthy condition, or at least you know better than most horses are living with, then I'll say, okay, if there's any residual behavioural issues left, then I'll show you how to train them. Mm-hmm. And then that usually sorts them out. But, uh, you know, a, a thoroughbred trainer actually taught me this many years ago 
And he used to come in and say, oh, this horse doesn't want to go into barriers or it doesn't want to run fast or it you know, doesn't want to do this and that. And, I mean, there is no training in the thoroughbred world uh, from from the perspective of, of, you know, point, go. They don't even know stop. They don't really know steering. But, you know, it's amazing how in those horses that if they're having difficulty on the track, it's always related to pain. And, and you know, it was my job to find their source of pain and, and identify and treat it. And once we got that resolved, the horse, without any training, would go back and happily enter the barriers and jump out of the gates and, and run in a straight line and lose all, all of the hysteria that they had before. So it was a very good lesson for someone out of the dress of sport horse world to, yep. to learn that. You know, a lot of that hysteria and, and volatility in horses is them just trying to express their distress about having to work when they're uncomfortable. Okay, okay. You talked about sore back, but at the saddle fit, how important is that? Oh, it's a nightmare. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they really need to make a law where it's illegal to sell a saddle that doesn't fit. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not allowed to buy a car that doesn't work. You're not allowed to buy a lawnmower that doesn't work. I can't believe you're allowed to sell saddles and, and, and have them not fit for purpose. So uh, it's it's probably nearly 99% guaranteed your saddle's not going to fit. Uh, and sadly, the saddle fitted in the country and probably around the world are often wanting to blame the horses or blame the riders and blame their saddle fitting skills. Uh, so I think people need to learn the science to look for saddle fit issues. I mean, most people know about dry spots and scruffled up hair, mm-hmm. and if they don't, they need to know about it. Uh, most, but what what's a really handy way to figure out whether you've got a saddle fit problem is if, well, first of all, if you go to put your saddle on the horse and the horse runs away from the saddle, yep. that's a major red, major red flag. And I, I've even had clients' horses who, You've got to put the dressage saddle on, which does fit, and the horse stands still. And then you turn around 20 seconds later and switch over and go to put the jumping saddle on, and the horse runs away. They, they mm. even know which brand of saddle is causing the problem. Yep. Uh, I mean, I had one client who, who rode in three different saddles, and the horse knew which one of those three saddles was the issue, which I thought was pretty impressive. Um, so, yes, if you put your saddle on, the horse runs away, and then you've got a saddle fit issue. But... A simple way that you can tell if you don't really know anything about it, aside from pop it on uh, with no saddle cloth and then lift the flap up and look underneath and if you can see daylight where the saddle's bridging, then that's a bit of a sign. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's a massive sign. So that's the easy way for you to tell. And the other way is pop your saddle on and then put your hand up underneath it and then just rub the skin with your finger. And if you've got any bruising from the saddle, then they will flinch and flip their skin or run away from you if you rub underneath the saddle. And that's something that saddle fitters are not doing either because, uh, I mean, I was, I've got a saddle fitting. I'm a saddle level one saddle fitter myself, but we weren't taught this either. But one day I was out there with a horse who kept getting a reoccurring sore back, and I'm like, this is weird, the saddle's fitting. Not sure why we keep getting a sore back, and uh, and then for some reason, oh, I don't know why. Well, I must have been talking to the lady, and I just rubbed the skin with my finger, and the horse really fell over. And I'm like, oh, hang on a minute, wow. mm. it's a very subtle saddle fit. So I find a finger rub while the saddle's on, because you can rub their skin when the saddle is off. This is for subtle saddle fit issues. You can check the saddle looks good. You can check the saddle of the rider; it looks good. You can watch them working; looks good. And yet the horse seems to have a sore back, right? And then if you check their skin, like, which I do just by rubbing my fingers along it sort of quite roughly, and then they don't flinch, and you think, oh, no, well, everything looks good. But if you pop the saddle on and then rub underneath the saddle with your fingers, and particularly in any areas where you think, hmm, that's pretty good but maybe not perfect, the second the saddle's on and you rub underneath it, they will flinch. Okay. So it's a wonderful, easy way for anyone to tell whether they've got a saddle fit bruise problem or not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wish all professionals would learn to do it because I've had a few brawls with saddle fitters in my time okay. about that very issue. Yeah. <laughs> and they yeah. try and blame the rider or the horse. I'm yes. like, no, your saddle fitting needs to improve. And that's what we're <laughs> going to do to the saddle fitters. We've got to say, no, keep trying. Yep, yep, yep. What about any other causes of back pain? 
anything else that we can talk about in that area? Aside from the comet, the most common thing saddle fit, people don't realise that when horses fall over mm. or pull back yep. or have collisions, that, that's how you injure the spine. I mean, if, if you watch a trained um, spinal manipulative person, so that's a chiropractor or an osteopath yep. who's specifically been trained to adjust horses, if you actually watch them adjust horses, you'll be astonished at how little effort is required to change the horse's spine. So, you know, if if a, a 70 kilo human can do a little shove with their two arms, which is probably be lucky to be a 30 kilo push, mm-hmm. if that can change a horse's spine, then, then imagine what's happening when 500 kilos is hitting the ground at, say, 20, 30, 40 kilometres an hour. Yeah. So yeah. It's, enormous forces going through their body. So that's how they end up with a lot of problems. You know, mm-hmm. it really affects the rib cage, which um, has massive impl- implications for their ability to lift up and around their back. Uh, so, you know, falling over and pulling back the same thing. I mean, they must be putting, they'd have to be putting 500 to 1,000 kilos of force through their sacroiliac joint and the top of their pole when they pull back. Yep. Same when they crash into one another, enormous forces in the directions that their spine's not meant to take. So, I mm-hmm. mean, that's where back pain comes from. And, and you know, people don't bother to think, oh, darn it, you've fallen over, now I better go get your back checked. Yeah. But you really should be. And mm. his, which leads to the next point is, uh, unfortunately, in this country, and I think it probably happens all over the world, but um, there, there are more untrained people calling themselves chiropractors out there than there are trained people. Yeah. So you need to make sure, you might say, oh, yeah, I've got the masseur or the chiro out and he did his back or she did his back and doesn't seem, said, it, said he's fine or said whatever, but there's no real difference. Unless you take the time to investigate the training in that person, then you may not necessarily have achieved anything with the money you just spent. So you yeah. need to make sure that the person is a qualified um, uh, manipulative therapist. Yep. In which case, there's a website for that, the Animal Biomechanical Professional Australia. I'll never get that acronym right. But anyway, <laughs> I think I think them. if you uh, go to our website anyway, I'm sure there's a link on that to it as well. You'll we'll find um, them. Yep. But, yeah, you and the other way to tell whether they're qualified is if they cost fifty or eighty dollars, they're untrained, I'm afraid. Yes. <laughs> Those of us okay. who actually bothered to pay to go to university, unfortunately, we have to charge a bit more because we'll never get our money back. Mm-hmm. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look horsechats.com. All right. And I think, you know, you talk about unqualified professionals. I think that goes not just for backs. I think there's quite a lot of, um, you know, people that we should be looking at qualified professionals within the within the industry. Well, you would hope it statistically improves your chances of success. <laughs> All right. What about other lameness? Well, here's the other one that uh, I get called out. So uh, this is an interesting one. I would say that if I get called for a, for a chiropractic appointment, mm. if I would say probably 50% of the horses I get called to visit as the chiropractor actually need my lameness veterinary hat to visit them. So, okay. so, you know, there's a large number of horses out there are lame and people really need to write this on their forehead or the fridge. Lameness almost never comes from the shoulders. So mm-hmm. just to give you an idea, I've yep. been practising yep. since 95, so what's that, 23 years. In 23 years, I have seen two shoulder lameness cases. Mm-hmm. So people need to stop blaming shoulders for lamenesses, and it's almost never coming from the spine either. So I've probably seen one horse in 23 years that had a spinal-related lameness. Mm-hmm. The rest of them, well, you know, no foot, no horse. All the rest of the problems are coming from feet and, uh, you know, the joints further up. But it will not be shoulders and it's highly likely to not be the spine. But shoulders and spines get blamed for a lot of lamenesses. Yep, yep, yep. I can remember I was working for a trainer. We had a few horses. I 
you know, I had to get the horses ready, get them um, in the truck ready to go. And I went down to the stables where he was, which was, you know, a few hundred metres away. And I said, I can't get this particular horse on the truck or on the float. And he goes, why not? I said, well, it's really lame. And he goes, whereabouts? And I said, it's in the shoulder. And he took me aside. He said, Glennis, horses just don't get lame in the shoulder. You know, like everyone will blame the shoulder. Horses just don't get lame in the shoulder. And I said, look, I really think it's the shoulder. No, this just doesn't happen. And he said, tell me what's happening. And I said, well, he can't lift his leg. He's dragging his toe. And when I go to take him out of the box, he cannot lift his front leg over, you know, the little board that kept the the bedding in. And he said, oh, maybe it is the shoulder. You know, it's it's because he was telling me, look, doesn't matter. I, I understand that you can see if a horse is lame, but this is not going to be shoulder. And he said the same thing. You just don't see shoulder lameness, you know. He was. He was unusually, uh, not very many trainers say that, so good on him. But, yes. um, yeah, just not being able to lift your foot over the board, will that might be a, a rare rare one, slightly higher yeah. up the leg, although a knee will do that too. So. Yeah, I think they ended up x-raying and, um, yeah, it was shoulder, yeah. But I, I think that was about the only one that I've seen. A lot of people say shoulder, you're right. Yeah, I mean, but they'll look shouldery because they're kind of using so much muscle up there to mm, actually get mm. around for whatever the problem is further down. So as a general rule, if you think shoulder, just think that it's not. Yep, yep. What about stifles? Okay, so the other thing that uh, that people commonly miss, and probably I'm at an age now where I'm getting to appreciate this more. I remember about uh, 10 or so years ago, a very famous vet from England, I think Sue Dyson's her name, she said back then, watch out for stifles. Okay. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. But, I mean, that was more when I was in racetrack practice. Mm -hmm. And you don't see a lot of stifle issues in in young horses. But certainly as I have followed the careers of horses over the last, say, 15 years, and I've known the horses for 15, even up to 20 years, um, there's no question that as they start to age, you do see stifle lameness become more relevant. And, I mean, a lot of people talk about hocks and they, you know, get their hocks injected. You hear that happening very commonly. But I see a lot of horses who are being misdiagnosed uh, because they've got stifle disease. And the, the trick with stifles is they're really hard to diagnose because they don't, the swelling is not easy to see. They may not respond that much to a flexion test, but they can be quite catastrophically lame with them. So uh, probably in the, in the hind leg lamenesses, if it's not a foot lameness, then the next place I'd probably jump to is a stifle. Okay. And then if it's not that and it's a dressage horse, then I'd probably think high suspensory. But they're probably the most common areas, if you can't see any visible swelling in the leg, mm-hmm. that you need to think about. Okay. Okay. And they're missed all the time. So yep. very common. Yep, yep. All right. Tell us about ML balance. Uh, so that's medial lateral imbalance in okay. hind feet. So, so the hind feet of all horses grow faster on the inside than the outside. Mm-hmm. That's just a fact of the way that their legs stand. They stand slightly turned out and their body weight is down through the outside of the foot, which means there's less blood flow through the outside of the foot, which which results in slower growth on the outside than the inside. And so if that horse was running like a proper wild bromby across the mountain, the mountain would trim down the inside of the foot to keep it balanced. Okay. But usually they're, usually they're shod or they're being looked after by trimmers who don't know about the fact that they grow fast on the inside. And so they commonly get left with what's called medial lateral imbalance. And if you stand at the front of the horse and squat down and look at his coronets, they should be parallel to the ground. And the same as if the horse is walking away from you, the the coronet at the back of the foot should be parallel to the ground. But if they've got medial lateral imbalance, i.e. they're higher on the inside, you'll see... The, you'll see the height on the inside. So what the farrier or the trimmer is always meant to be mindful of is the fact that this is a natural growth pattern and our job is to try and keep them square. Okay. And, and I would say I don't think I've ever seen a farrier get it right. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That's how significant this problem is. So okay. when you get medial lateral imbalance in your hind feet, you end up with a horse that has a hock wobble. Yep. People have talked about hock wobbles, and yes. so they usually go and inject the hocks, but they don't straighten up the foot. Okay. The next okay. thing you get when you've got a medial lateral imbalance is 
I mean, basically, you're bowing the whole leg out sideways. You end up with stifle disease. So, because you, you're straining the outside aspect of every joint up that leg. So, if if owners start to pressure their farriers a bit more to get stuck into the inside of those hind feet, you will see a lot less hind end blindness. Yeah, just needs yep. to be done. Yep. And you know, the farrier will say, "Oh, but he grows that way." Well, yes, they all grow that way. Some more than others. So, yep. your job to keep it level it up. Yeah. 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 All right. Now, I know you've got, you know, you're pretty passionate about horses' feet, so I want to go into that a bit more because it is important. You know, you've already pointed out that particularly in hind feet that you start off, you've got to get the coronet, you've got to get the hoof right, otherwise you're going to have problems in the hock or the stifle. But can we talk about the types of shoes and the types of, um, you know, a little bit more about the feet there? So this is just some tips that, uh, you know, once I've got my book written, you'll be able to see lots more tips. Good. Tell us when you do, yep. <laughs> <laughs> this is just some basic things that everybody can encourage their farriers to do. And, and I think uh, uh, as a riding population, if we all start pressuring the farriers at once, they might change. Yep. So, um, <laughs> and, and they're doing the best they can with the knowledge that they have. Yep. But uh, we need to crack some doors open a little bit. And you can begin with the type of shoe that you put on. And, and basically what's happening is, People put priority to the shoe not wearing out. So the bigger the horse, the heavier the steel they usually use because they don't want the shoe to wear out, do they? Yep, yep. So if the shoe doesn't wear out, who do you think is going to wear out? Mm. Probably the horse. So I always like to use a shoe that will wear out. So I would prefer if I had to shoe a horse, thank God I don't anymore, but <laughs> if I had to shoe a horse, I want to wear, use a shoe that, for a start, has what's called a full rolling edge, which means there's a bevel around the whole shoe, meaning that the horse has good break over in all directions. And that shoe is made by the company St. Croix, and the brand of it is Eventa. Okay. You can get online and have a look at what I mean about the full rolling shoe. Uh, it comes in steel and aluminium, but remember I said I want the shoe to wear out, not the horse to wear out, so I actually prefer aluminium because an aluminium shoe will at least wear a good breakover edge in the, in the most common direction that that foot, that foot is travelling. And you want it to wear a good edge on it because that's going to protect the joints above it. Mm-hmm. If that shoe holds its square edge, then you are straining joints. Yep, yep. So literally every horse needs to be shot in these St. Croix Venters. The problem is they don't, I don't think they go for super little horses, which most of them don't really need shoes anyway. Um or then you need to put some breakover on the shoe, put a rolled toe on or a full rolling edge. There used to be a trotting half round, it was called. I'm not sure if it's still available, but it was also a shoe that had a full rolling edge. Um, but otherwise, if that's not available and you're in tiny feet or you're in giant feet, then, you know, aluminium's good because by the third week, that shoe will have worn a beautiful bevel onto the edge of it and brought the breakover back for the horse. So mm-hmm. that's a simple way you can help them. Okay. Uh, another thing that really needs to happen is people get distressed about contracted heels. Did you know that if a farrier never trimmed the frogs, you would never get contracted heels? Oh, That's really? Scary. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But they're a delightful way of, you know, they pick the foot up and they run their knife down each side of the frog and then usually at the centre of it and they say, oh, that'll clean the thrush out. Yeah, yeah. That's what causes contracted heels because the frog then drops down through the shoe. Yep. Because it's trying to reach the ground, mm. and that brings the heels in narrower. So, if you want to either prevent contracted heels or help them, stop cutting a frog. And by the way, do you know what the frog's real purpose is? Oh, whatever I say, you're going to tell me it's not. So, just tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, the frog is their fingertip. Okay. It's full of nerve endings. Mm-hmm. It's got an enormous amount of sensory nerves in it. That's how they feel the ground. So do you want your fingertips cut off? No, definitely not. Probably not. Yep. Probably not. So you stop cutting their fingertips off, they'll stop half the tripping. So, you know, if we can just get every farrier in the country and the world to stop trimming frogs, yep. then you will have a lot healthier back of the foot. And what's underneath your frog? Your navicular bone. You know, mm-hmm. if you start wondering why navicular disease occurs, if you've got a... If you've got a race of people keep chopping the thing that supports the navicular bone away, then what are you you're going to put the tissue at risk there? Yep. 
taking the support away from it. So it's yep. a simple thing to do. You know, a lot of farriers say, oh, but he'll get thrush in it. Well, you can just say to the farrier, yeah, well, I'll pick that. I'll pick his foot out. You know, let yes. me be responsible yep. for the mud. Yep. I want my horse to have a frog. Because the thing is, when it gets wet, those frogs fall off really easily when they're ready to, don't they? Yeah, yeah. They yeah. don't really need help to fall off mm. when they're ready to fall off. But yep. who are we to say that that frog's ready to come off? Yep. So, yeah, keep your frog. I think I've had seen about one farrier in the thoroughbred industry not trim frogs. Mm-hmm. And those, because yeah, and the, I use thoroughbreds as an example because they're, you know, renowned for their bad feet. And these thoroughbreds, because they didn't have their frogs trimmed, you couldn't tell that they were thoroughbred feet. And they were racing thoroughbreds. And yet, because their frogs were not trimmed, those feet looked like lovely warm blood feet. Okay. So it's quite impressive what not trimming frogs can do. Just let it peel itself. The other part that farriers aren't trimming well enough is they leave the bars untrimmed so they get bent or they really protrude up sometimes even above the height of the um, the wall and they're a great source of abscessing and foot pain. So, you know, if, if there's nothing that changes in the hoof industry aside from foot full rolling aluminium shoes on them, don't trim your frogs and do trim your bars, and then have a shoeing interval of, say, four weeks and no longer, then you will dramatically reduce the number of vet visits you get to your horse. Okay. It's almost putting you out of business there, Mel. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I'm, very ter- I'm a terrible salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> what about bare feet? Well, bare feet, despite what the authorities like to say, bare feet require a lot of commitment. So, you know, they require an even more frequent trimming interval. Mm-hmm. You really can't go past four weeks for them. And for the big horses, oftentimes they need to be trimmed every two weeks. You need to be more committed to your sugar management for a barefoot horse because they're not a numb-footed horse. When you shoe horses, they've got numb feet. That's why we like them. Uh, but a barefooted horse will tell you about the fact that their world's not quite right and they'll go sore because of it. So there's a lot more commitment required to have a barefooted horse. It's certainly quite achievable and thoroughly enjoyable when you know the secrets to it. And all horses of all breeds in all sports can achieve it. But, you know, there's a hell of a lot more work required to achieve it nicely. Okay. What did you say about the sugar before? Make sure the sugar's up? Uh, well, you know, that people are starting to find out that horses are a creature that needs to eat a fairly low sugar diet. Okay. And uh, if you've got your horse out there on the lovely green grass and he's shod, you're probably going to be less aware of the fact that the sugar's causing problems. But if you've got a barefooted horse out there on the lovely green grass, he's going to tell you about it causing problems. So okay. you know, they, you'll be much more aware of uh, problems, which is why usually what happens is people blame the horse and they blame the fact that he's not wearing shoes and say, oh, well, horse's foot sore or he's gone lame, therefore he needs shoes on. Well, no, he's foot sore or he's gone lame because your management wasn't quite right. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. if you want to have bare feet because you want to have them healthier, you need to be more aware and uh, um, more accountable for the environment and your trim interval and your trim technique. Yep, yep. Bit of a nuisance. (laughs) All right. Now, just to uh, to sum up, you know, we've been talking about 10 common problems with horses that catch people out. And our um, equine vet, Melanie Quick, who does specialise in lameness and equine spiral manipulative therapy, we're going to talk now about gassy guts and how gassy guts can catch people out. They don't quite recognise what the problem is. And so if you can talk to us, Mel, about gassy guts, you know, what sort of symptoms we should be looking at and also what we should do about it? This is, this is one I only sort of stumbled across by accident. Um, okay. it, apply, it applies to humans as well as horses. Yep. <laughs> but yep. Uh, when, you, when you get the diet correct in the human or the horse, and actually they're not very gassy animals. Mm. Uh, and so one of the signs that you, you've got a dietary problem is if that horse is um, breaking wind in front of you all the time or even when you work saddling, tacking him up or doing his feet or whatever you're doing, giving him, grooming the horse and they're busy passing wind constantly, you've actually got a horse that's most likely eating too much sugar. Okay. Uh, and interestingly, now my horses live on a fairly low sugar uh, lifestyle because they're barefooted horses, so you've got to have low sugar lifestyle for them. They're, they're astonishingly less gassy and, in fact, 
uh, if I have a – because I live in probably the worst laminitis country in Australia where I am here, like I can grow grass 10 foot tall. So it's warm and it's wet, but mm -hmm. it's not tropical. So okay. um, I have certain times of the year where I struggle to keep the grass under control. And I can guarantee you that if I'm underneath that horse trimming them and I'm hearing their gut rumbling while I'm working, then I'm going to have – feet that have got more heat, a bit of a pulse to them. So uh, you don't want to be listening to rumbly guts a lot and you don't want to be having a farty horse because that means you've actually got most likely a sugar consumption problem, in which case you'll have slightly sore feet and a horse that can't perform well enough. So mm -hmm. that's just something, you know, people often laugh when the horse is walking along in front of them, breaking wind, but uh, it's actually a sign that those that gut on that animal is it comfortable and in fact one of the common causes at certain times of the year you'll hear like just recently um so three weeks ago or oh, four weeks no just before christmas just before christmas i had a lot of people telling me about horses colicking because we'd suddenly got hot so okay. there's more impaction yep. yep and just as we entered spring i had a lot of people telling me they were getting spasmodic colics mm -hmm. so uh to me, I think spasmodic colics are related to gas production and gas production is happening when you've got a sugar consumption issue. So mm -hmm. you don't really want a gassy horse, probably nor a gassy human either. <laughs> yes, yes, well, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. All right, but you've certainly done a great job telling us about and just drawing attention to things that do catch people out, you know, that are a problem, that um, one is related to another. If we look at the holistic horse, yeah, one thing is going to change something else and it's not going for the second thing, it's going for the first thing and fixing that up, which will also fix the second thing. Mm -hmm. I think particularly interesting was the, um, you know, the imbalance and how the imbalance in the, the feet that can cause the hock wobble and the stifle disease and how that's often misdiagnosed. Yeah. Yeah, you know, lots of people get very excited about hot wobbles. Lots of therapists get excited about hot okay. wobbles. Hot yep. wobbles. Yep. But seriously, just look downstairs further because look at the cause. Probably ninety ninety five to mm. ninety nine percent of the time, it's actually starting from the foot, and you get you get hip restrictions. You know, the horse will have trouble doing canter transitions because they can't engage well enough. Um, they'll have a tight ropey tight rope action. You know, when they tight rope walk. Yep. Um, type yep. of action. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably struggle to sit down and engage and do extended trots. It, it's just got, you know, they, they most likely have sacroiliac pain, hamstring pain, you know, lots of secondary pain and discomfort as a result. So, you know, and everybody thinks, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, everybody knows the foot's got to be square and balanced, but it's still. Uh, it's not difficult to achieve. You just need to spend another minute on that foot each mm -hmm. time. And when you've got a farrier who's overworked and getting tired and you don't really appreciate how much pressure these boys are under until you get under a horse and do it yourself, yep. um, it, it takes a lot of willpower to force yourself just to take that extra couple of minutes balancing that foot. So I don't blame them. But I think if we can quietly nag them a little bit more to say, mm -hmm. hey, I'd rather you actually went a little bit slower, Yes. Maybe do one less horse a day so yep. that you can put the group power into getting it square. I mean, I know myself, I had one of the trimmers I work with, she broke her collarbone and I had to, for one, for two weeks while she recovered from surgery, I had to take over a few of her cases. So I think I was trimming eight horses a day. And mm. Normally I'd probably, I'd probably only trim well, maybe 20 horses a week because I'm only doing yeah, problem horses. But as soon as I had to shift to doing eight a day, which is still not many, by the time I got to the six and a half horse, it was curious to note that my brain no longer wanted to concentrate on doing it properly. Okay. I found that quite yep. fascinating. Yep. And I mean, yep. you know, I, I, I'm a person who, who does pretty much only specialty work and specialty trimming and specialty hoof care. Mm -hmm. I have no problem making those perfect. But once I had to get into routine maintenance, and just routine work, I I was fascinated to see that I struggled to make myself concentrate once I got past about the six or seven horse. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I think that will be happening to them. So you know, if it means that you need to feed your farrier before they start, <laughs> okay. 
Do some little tricks like that. Make sure yeah. their blood sugar's not falling through the toilet and they're not exhausted. If it means you've got to make them drink two litres of water before they start because they're yep. hot and worn out, yep. you need to make sure their brain's coping because if they're not coping physically or mentally, and they won't tell you about it because they probably don't even know about it, mm -hmm. they're not going to have the energy or the willpower to put that balance into the foot. Okay. That's the excuse I'll let them have anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Now, Mel, um, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all your tips and tricks and, you know, all the extra information you give us. And um, I think this 10 common problems with horses that catch people out is, again, the, the type of audio, the type of chat that people will go back and listen again and again because there's just so much information in it. So thank you. And if people would like to contact you, they can contact you. They can go to horsechats.com slash Melanie Quick too, or search for Melanie, search for Quick, or what other contact details? We'll put them on that page. But if they'd like to contact you and they've got their, you know, ready to go now, how could they contact you? Oh, uh, the website's theproblemhorse.com. Okay, which is a pretty easy one to remember. Pretty easy. Yeah. I think if you just type my name into the into Google, it'll it'll come up pretty easily. So mm -hmm. you'll find me. All right, and all your contact details will be on there. And as I said, that link yeah. will be on Horse yep. Chats. Yep, yep. So thank you for coming. We're looking forward to, you know, something else that you're going to teach us next time and, and um, hope to see you soon. That's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 